There we go. All right. Ready to get started. So we are at what is called SOF, the end of our first book chat uh, book study. It is definitely an accomplishment for our little sisterhood. We have gone through you know individual studies with feast days and so on and so forth, but this is the first time we've studied together as a sisterhood, as a part of Titus too. So I am very happy about it. And um, I'm looking forward to the one that we have coming up, y'all willing, next week when we go into the book of Genesis. But we'll talk about that a little later. So let's recap what we did. Some of the, the points that really stuck out to us last week when we did um, chapter 20. Mm -hmm. Well, we kind of took a step back to take a look at and understand um, the spring feast days because it's through the spring feast days that we really begin to understand the logistics of what Yahushua did and when he did it and what all these things mean. And it was important for us to understand as, as, a, as a Hebrew thinker how the ancient people would have measured their days, that it, that it begins and ends at sunset. And even though these things seems like, you know, what do they matter? They matter as we begin to piece and walk through um, prophecy. So we understand the timeline that Yah has given us. And we say the days begin at sunset and, and because we're just following that pattern that it was evening and then morning. So the evening part of the day first and the morning part of the day. And this is why uh, Sabbath keepers keep Sabbath from Friday evening until we get to um as the day goes out for Saturday evening, then we end our Sabbath. And as we go through the journey of the spring feast days, we um, we understand that Yahushua was crucified on the Passover. We took a look at these two scriptures. Um, he's called our Passover lamb. Even when we went to start this journey in John chapter one, that's how John received Yahushua when he saw him. He said, behold, the lamb of Elohim that removes the sin of the world. So that was an indication of who Yahushua was, that he was this offering for, for Passover. And we spent some time um, on the beginning of chapter 20 because we wanted to understand the timetable of what was happening when the women went to the, the garden tomb to what they thought they were going to do was prepare Yahushua's body because they didn't have time to do that because a high Sabbath was coming, which was the first day of unleavened bread. And we, we we walked it out, you know, visually, because that's how I learn. It's, to me, I think it's just helpful to be able to see what things are. And as, as we walk through um, this template, we were sure that when the women got to the sepulcher, it was early Sunday morning. And not only was it early Sunday morning, that the Messiah was already gone. And why why does all of this matter? All of this matters because like we talked about prophecy, it matters. And everything that Yahushua did is a part of prophecy. And we went back to another feast day that falls during that week of unleavened bread, which comes the day after Passover. And we spoke about Rashid Omer, that being um, the first fruit is the beginning of a 50 day count. And that day is always on a Sunday. And what the ancient Israelites would have done is they would have taken a sheaf, um, uh, a sheaf of wheat, and they would have literally waved it, right? They would have waved the sheaf. And one of the things that we also looked at how Yahushua connected himself to this wave sheaf is in John 12, 24, where he himself said, verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abides alone. But if it die, it brings forth much fruit. So he was giving us a little hint right there that he was going to be that grain that was going to die, but it also was going to be offered. And so we connected, and then this is why we went through the steps of step what a day is, because it was, it's need for us to know that Yahushua was fulfilling the feast of um, Rashid Omer when the when he was seen by Miriam 
and she and he told her not to touch him because he had not yet ascended. But we'll touch that a little later on today. The other thing that um, we kind of spent some time on last week was Yahushua telling his disciples that whatever sin they remitted will be remitted, and whatever sins they retained, they retained. Um, but this isn't, and this is a miss interpretation, um, the way Christianity, specifically the Catholic Church, takes that verse. They take that verse as believing that you have to go to a priest and that priest has to, you have to confess to this priest, this earthly human priest, and this priest has to be the one to to forgive you of your sins. That was never the intention of Yahushua when he said this. That has never been how your sins were forgiven. You never had to have another person forgive you for your sins. It says, the scriptures teach us that um, Yahushua, that he, his death is for the remission of our sins. He did that. Before that, we offered, we were able to offer a sacrifice to cover our sins, but we don't have to do that anymore because of what Yahushua did for us. And this thought was is really connected to this whole concept of binding and loosen, which um, is in Matthew 16. But when we took a look at some of the information behind these two thoughts, um, we took a look at this quote from the Exegetical Dictionary of the New Testament, and it says that bind and loose are technical terms in Judaism with respect to teaching. The phrase is used for authoritative exposition of the law by an authorized or ordained rabbi who has authority to forbid and to permit. So in other words, Yahushua was giving his disciples this authority to teach and to give um permission to, um, I mean, that's it, right? Basically to teach. And um, so this was the the last thing we spent a lot of time on, but the chapter ended off with one of the verses we began when we started our John study, right? Because John had his gospel written with intention and a purpose. I, I don't think we see it as clearly, maybe in Luke we might see it clear, but John's purpose was from the beginning, like you look at this like a law case, how is how I tend to see it. And he starts out with his opening statement and then he just gives all the evidence for his case. And now we're getting to the closing statements. And at the end of chapter 20, he says, many other signs truly did Yahushua in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Yahushua is the Messiah the son of Elohim, and that believing you might have life through his name. So with that being said, um, that's a, just a recap from chapter 20. Any thoughts about chapter 20 before we move on to chapter 21? Anything that maybe was an important highlight to you that I might not have touched? Okay, so we're going to go ahead into chapter 20. And we're going to start off by just reading verses 1 through 3. Um, After these things, Yahushua showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and on this wise showed himself. There were together Simon Peter and Thomas, called Didymus, and Nathanael of Canaan, Cana in Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, and two other of his disciples. Simon Peter said unto them, I go fishing. They say unto him, we also go with you. They went forth and entered into a ship immediately. And that night they caught nothing. So right here we have so far from all all the disciples, according to scripture, at least four of them were fishermen. In this scenario, at, at this point, at least seven of them are out there fishing. And that's significant um, because when we, when in some of the gospels we see Yahushua calling his disciples, he he calls them while they are fishing. So let's take a look at if someone can get Matthew chapter four and verses eighteen and nineteen. I'd appreciate it. Matthew chapter four verses eighteen and nineteen. I got it. Thank you. The book of Matthew chapter four, verses eighteen and nineteen. Okay. And Yehoshua, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon called Peter, and Andrew his brother, 
casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Hallelujah. And we want to keep that last thought in mind. He said, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Right? This is the backdrop to this last conversation. Um, one of the last conversations that Yahushua was going to have with his disciples. Okay? So let's continue on to verse 11. Um, verse 4. We can pick up at verse 4 and continue um, through to verse 11. And when the morning was now come, Yahushua stood on the shore, but the disciples knew not that it was Yahushua. Then Yahushua said unto them, Children, have you any meat? They answered him, No. And he said unto them, Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and you shall find. They cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes. Therefore that disciple whom Yahushua loved said unto Peter, it is the master. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the master, he girt his fisher's coat unto him, for he was naked, and did cast himself into the sea. And the other disciples came in a little ship, for they were not far from land, but as it were two hundred cubits, dragging the net with fishes. As soon then as they came to land, they saw a fire of coals there and fish laid thereon, and bread. Yahushua said unto them, Bring of the fish which you have now caught. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land full of great fishes, and hundred and fifty and three, and for all there were so many, yet was not the net broken. So we're going to stop there for a moment and kind of spend some time with this this whole picture that's happening, this whole scenario that's happening with Peter and the disciples fishing and knowing what we just read in Matthew that Yahushua said that he's going to make them, make disciples, fishers of men. And I have a memory when our first rabbi taught us this and he made us kind of focus or pay attention to what does it take to be a, a successful fisherman fisherman. And one of the things that, you know, you just take things for granted. You never stop and just consider a thing. But one of the things it takes to be a good fisherman is you have to know what bait to use, right? You have to know when's the best time to fish. There's some fish that are busy during the day. There's fish that's busy during the night. Like these, when they were fishing, they were fishing at night. Um, you have to know the timing. You have to know a good bait. You have to know, um, what might be the best way to actually fish for them, right? Um, what type of net do you need? You need a net that has big uh, spaces or small spaces. So, you know, when you think about the process that we take for granted for fishing, it makes you consider why Yahushua chose them to be fishermen. And just from the story that we, we've gone through thus far, as fishers of men, we go where he sends us. Because he told them, go on the opposite side. Now, if you picture, if you imagine a lake, a river, you know, there's no magic line in the middle of the river where one side has no fish, but the other side has all this fish, right? There's no, there's no magic line. They might be, you know, um, the current of which way the, the current is flowing, that'd be more advantageous. But whatever it is, I don't I don't think it's because there was anything logistical more accurate with the right side. I believe it was just an indication for us or a lesson for us to learn to go where he sends us, right? As we go through this book, it's not just to get the information, but application. There's no wasted word in in the word of, of the Father. There, there, there's a reason for it. Um and the other thought that came to me was there will be success when we obey his voice. Peter could have, I mean, in one of the other gospels, you know, a similar scenario. He's just like, we were here all night. We caught no fish, but you know what he did? He did it anyway. Right. You might feel in your life, hey, I've been doing this and it's just not working. But just if you know you received a word from the father to do a thing, 
success will be at the end. As long as we're walking in obedience to his voice. Hallelujah. So as we were, you know, reading this, I got, I stopped at this number of fish. Uh-huh. Because I don't think it's there for no reason. Who said, uh-huh? Is that you, Precious? Yes. What's your thoughts? I'm, I'm in the shower. I said, <laughs> right before I come out, I listen in the shower. And I'm like, 153, why is that number? And I mean, for him to say that number, it has to specify something. So I'm like Googling, what does 153 mean? And I'm like, 153, they're saying 153 doesn't mean anything other than it's a large quality. So I'm like, okay, then that has to be it, that it, it's, it's so many. Right. And on face value, absolutely. That's a lot of fish. When you, you went from not having any fish to having 153 fish in a matter of a moment that is significant. Anybody else? Um, did anybody else stop at this number? Did, did you like wonder why? And it's fine if you didn't, because some like it's a number, right? Sure. Yes. My, my head does a weird type of math. It, it's different. So I literally go, oh, one plus five is six. Six plus three um, is nine. And for some reason, it was giving, it was leading me toward the disciples. For, for some reason, the, the 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 adding up of the numbers was leading, you know, because five plus three is eight and eight plus one is, you know, it, it, it was just like, it was leading me nine, but for some reason I kept hearing the 12 disciples were in that. Okay, I like that thought. And let me tell you why I like that thought. All right. When we look at the, all right, remember, who are we talking about? We're talking about Hebrews, mm -hmm. right? We're talking about a different language. Okay. The Hebrew language is also an alphanumeric language, just like, mm -hmm. uh, right? Roman numerals are alphanumeric. Um, so there is a, I'm going to keep it as simple as possible, right? Words can have a number value because each letter has a number value. And the system that, that in Judaism is called gemetria. And that's where we get our word geometry from. So it's just a matter of numbers. I mean, numbers can be letters and letters can be numbers. And then you can, each, each every word has a value. All right. So we, like I said, we're going to keep this real simple. So we take a look at the number 153. There is a word, a phrase in the scripture that has the exact same value. Now the thought is words that have the same value has some connection, right? They, there's some connection in words that have the same value. And the example, um, the easy example I can give is when we think about Noah, the scripture says, Noah found grace in Yahweh's eyes. And we look at the name Noah, the value of his name, oh boy, his value is 58. I think it's 58. Um, and the word for grace is chen, which also has the value 58. So it connects Noah with grace because they're, those two words have a, a similar value. And then Yahweh says in his word, he found this grace in Yahweh's eyes. So this is how we have connections with words that have the same numerical value. That's a simple example. But there's another one that has 153. And it is in the term B'nai Ha'elohim. And we see the term first in Genesis chapter six. And it literally means, like literally it would mean the uh, sons of Elohim, but sons of Elohim can also mean children of Elohim because words will always take a masculine, if a masculine gender, if it's a multiple, if it's a, if it's mixed with women, right? The male will always take the, the lead in the in the in the gender. You so we can always say B'nai Yisrael Ha Elohim also means children of Elohim. So when we see that, right? Now here's a thought. He's telling them to be fishers of men. They get this number that's connected with children of Elohim. And this is why I said El Shaber that thought about disciples, because it's almost like he's connecting the thought of them 
bringing forth or gathering the children of Elohim. That makes sense? Yeah. <laughs> and can I add something to that? Absolutely. Can I add something to that? Absolutely. Yeah, Prush. I just, I'm um, like looking here and I find, I don't know how you pronounce it. I don't know if you say Ani, A-N-I, Elohim. Ani. Ani, Elohim, which equals 153. So he's telling oh, me, I am yes. God. Yep, I did see that. Hallelujah. Yep, Ani Elohim has the same value. And that again, right? How many times did Yahushua? I am, right? I am, right? That was a good one, Press. Good, 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 good mm -hmm. find, good share. So is the, am, am I going to say this is exactly permanently, like ex this makes sense to me. It makes the connection. Is I don't think the connection is forced based on what he called them to do and what they're actually doing and then what's going to follow this conversation. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So let's, let's continue. Any, any other thoughts about this before we move on? Let's yes. Go ahead, One other, I don't understand why they didn't recognize his voice. <laughs> why is it that they're still as a group, not recognizing his voice? That's a good question because what I thought of is he must have appeared differently because he didn't even recognize his face, right? He may not recognize his face, but, but what happened voice. to his voice? Absolutely, I agree. Um, Absolutely. Um, well, so just a quick um, thought in regards to the number 153. I yeah. also added it up. I also added it up and got the number nine and was, um, as I'm thinking about it, um, it brought me to the... Um, the, the the ancient Hebrew Aleph Bet and its number correlation. Okay. And um, number nine uh, would be the letter Tet, and the pictogram associated with that. I, I I'm not sure if I'm remembering it right, but is it a basket? It is a basket. Mm -hmm. It is a basket. Okay. So 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 that can kind of tie in because since we're talking about it, it, talking about being a fisherman and having that um that net. Or something to, to 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 carry and to to gather with. Right. Um, can I can that's a connection I'm making. Absolutely, um, I can I can see that. I don't think that's forced either. I don't think that's. Cool. Hallelujah, Sister Ella Shaver, your hand was up. Yes, um, it was two separate thoughts. One was um, uh, what Sister Precious was saying about recognizing, and the other one was when you were speaking about um, casting the net on the right side. Um, Matthew 22, 44, Acts, uh, chapter two, around 33, it's talks about the son of Yah sitting at the right hand, you know? So for me, the signi I, I immediately saw a significance of the right being the right hand, you know, Amen. like he is on the right hand. Amen. Um, and then as far um, as what Sis Precious was saying, um, I actually, it was interesting to me. I'm like, what? You don't, you don't know who he is? But the one whom he loved said he recognized, oh, that's the master. And that to me was, was just so beautiful. Like, yeah, the one that he was, we don't know who his name is to this day, but it's the one that he loved, knew who he was. You know, Amen. he's the one that said that's the master. So it's it's just, you know, th those were the two things that pulled out for me. Amen. Told off for Amen. sure. All right, so let's continue to fourteen. Yeah, you know, and what's also interesting is they're fishing, but yet when they come to him, he already has food. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> he that one too. Right? He yes, says, yes, yes. Food, what you got? Right. Okay. Amen. Right. Amen. First, right? He asked them, children, you have anything to eat? And he tells them to go out there and fish <laughs> while he's on the shore serving them. Yahoo was their cook. <laughs> he prepared them for some food. breakfast. No, he <laughs> prepared them food. You know, just it, again, that servant mm. that he is. Remember, he's already dead, resurrected, ascended, and mm. here he comes cooking for the <laughs> disciples. Wow. A perfect example, an epitome of his servanthood 
Mm-hmm. It didn't stop when he washed their feet, right? Mm-hmm. Here he is cooking for them. And, and in that same vein, when I came to that scripture, it was like he said, he said, he's he's telling them to add, add to what he's already brought. Yes. Right. He's done, he's done his part. Hallelujah. The followers. And he's like, you now you guys add to it. That's right. That's mm-hmm. right. Um, That's yes, yes. Hallelujah. <laughs> Excuse me. Hallelujah. 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 Sister Emily Rice said amazing. Hallelujah. It is. All right. <laughs> So that's, I mean, right? Things that you just, th- this is how you know it's the Holy Spirit because how many times have we, I'm sure, individually have gone mm-hmm. through this and we're just now seeing the servanthood of Yahushua in what he's doing right now with his disciples. This is not part of my notes. You know what mm-hmm. I'm saying? This is not what I was prepared to touch on, but <laughs> this is why we spend time in Yahweh's oh, yeah. word. We're only going to get out of it what we put into it, right? If you oh, yeah. if you every now and then pick it up and read it, well, every now and then you're going to pick up something new. You're going to realize something. But when you stay in his word, oh, right, yeah. he's going to continue to, to give you insight and wisdom. Um, Sister Shula. Yeah, I dropped off there for a second. Um, there was a couple things that really stood out to me when we were reading um, this time. Like you said, um Back in verse six, where he says, uh, cast the net on the right side of the boat. And I thought about Yehoshua sitting on the right side of Yah Elohim. Amen. Um, you know, and that the, the multitude was going to come through casting on this side of the father. Amen. Um, yeah. And and then I want to think about now. They are, you know, fishing, of course, right? But I also thought about, uh, you know, the fish, you know, being fishers of men, you know, the fish for the multitude also being a representative of those that, you know, would be would be brought in, you know, to the faith. And it made me think about the importance of um, of caring for each other and Man. nourishing each other. Absolutely. And, um, you know, and, and feeding each other, you know, um, literally each of us, you know, can sacrifice, you know, for, for each other's uh, well-being and, um, and, con- and for the continuation of, of, of the, of the word of Elohim. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So that's this. Okay. So let's continue to verse 14. Yahushua said unto them, come and dine. And none of the disciples durst ask them, who are you? Knowing that it was the master. Yahushua would then come and take bread and give it to them and fish likewise. This is not the third time that Yahushua showed himself to his disciples after that he was risen from the dead. Now for context, this is during the time of the 50-day count of the Omer that will lead to the next feast day on the calendar, which would be Shavuot or Feast of Weeks. All right, so we get to this part of this conversation that I call the interrogation because Yahushua um, begins to interrogate Peter over three verses, right? They're not very long, but as we go through these three verses, you know, I want to do some observations because as we um, engage with the word, we need to engage with the word, right? The scripture says that the word is living which means we can engage with it. But if we don't literally intentionally do it, the word is never going to come alive to us. So we're going to do a little um, um, application right now together. So we're going to take a look at these verses, um, verses 15 to 17, right? I'm going to give us like two minutes. And during those two minutes, right, I want us to think about what question can you ask of the verse, of the verses, right? In other words, what else do you want to know about these events? Again, our, you know, my, our first teacher, our first rabbi, one of the things that he would talk about, he would say the Bible was, was like the game of Jeopardy. You had to have the right question to unlock the information, right? Question the word as we're reading it, right? And become curious, right? What else might you want to know as we read these verses? And then 
as we're going through it, we want to observe, right? Observe what is different because even though it's an interrogation, yeah, well, she was asking one person the same thing three times, but are there any differences? Are there any similarities? And these are the kind of things that we, we want to kind of begin to do with Yahweh's word um, when we're trying to get a better understanding. And when you get questions, these are the kind of questions that you can ask the Holy Spirit, right? You can pray about. You could put it in your, you know, your study journal or your personal journal of a question that you ask Yahweh and about his word. And then when that answer comes, you write that down, you memorialize it, and then you you begin to build your own reservoir of edification, right? It becomes your own witness that you know that Yahweh has answered or given clarity about something. So I'm going to leave this up and I'm going to set a timer. I was going to set a timer here, but I want to leave the questions up so you guys can refer back to it. And like I said, I'm just going to just do it for like two minutes. I don't know where these ants just come out from. Bane of my existence. All right. So I'm going to set a one minute timer. I mean, two minute timer. Take a look at these verses. And even if you have one question, and if you maybe you already have a question, right? Just spend the time now challenging yourself to question the verses and to observe any, any nuances between what is happening in the conversation. So let's let's do that now. We have about 45 seconds left. Okay, so that's two minutes. All right, so anyone wants to share a question that you came up with that you wanted that um, during this time with these verses? Well, I wrote down, do we love Yahushua more than the sheep? Did that make sense? Yeah, I understand the question. Do we love him more than the sheep? Are we? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Ema. Anybody else? Any other questions? Anybody else want to share a question they had? As you were reading the verse? I I, I did, but I, I will say I thought about... um. Son of Jonah, 
Son of Jonah. And and I thought about Jonah. And I thought about what was in Peter's heart to do or mm -hmm. not to do. Okay. So the question you had is why call him the son of Jonah? Not not necessarily why call him the son of Jonah. Um I, it made me think about Jonah the prophet also being son of Jonah. Mm -hmm. Um and Jonah having been a prophet and um how Yahweh had to chase down Jonah to get him to feed my sheep. Do what I tell you to do. Do what I tell you to do. And and it's um it's uh I see a little mirror there. Okay. Um, so I thought my my question was what was in Peter's heart, and I also wrote down son of Jonah. Like, is it a reflecting back on um the prophet? You know, and his what he desired to do over what the master desired to do. And then the first words also says, so when they had eaten breakfast, it automatically made me think about um, Deuteronomy chapter uh, eight, verse 10, and you shall, and you shall uh, eat, be satisfied and bless Yahweh. And it made me think, did, did they bless the master after they had eaten? So. Okay. That's a question you had personally. Okay. Let me get rid of this. All right. Told off for sharing. Um, um, I would, if the opportunity to speak this in the presence of the Father, I would really ask, um, what's the purpose for seemingly asking this, for, for asking what seems to be the same question three different times? Like, what is it? I would just ask if, if the opportunity is to know, right? Because right, absolutely. Clearly, clearly there's a reason why it's the same question, what seems to be the same question. Amen. Um, it's asked three times, and I would just ask, you know, the purpose behind that. Amen. That's fair. I, I'm, I'm trying. I can't find the thing to raise your hand. I, I'm sorry. Okay. Go ahead, sis. Shalom. Okay. I, I was just thinking about, you know, um, how with the three times, mm -hmm. it seems to be very significant to the times that, uh, when he deny uh uh he denied uh the three denials that he had Absolutely. and it just and it just seemed like you know when he say feed my sheep he denied him to sheep especially when the woman asked i, I believe she asked him aren't you with them aren't you with them you know he <laughs> denied it to the to the sheep, so he was saying, "You, you, not to deny me anymore, because these are my sheep. The ones that he had denied himself to were the sheep." Amen. I mean, that's how I kind of see. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Anyone want to share a question they had as it would bring the first? Like, if you have an opportunity to know more about the situation, what question would you ask? I had the question of: Is Peter the only disciple that Yahusha asked his question? Good question. Lord, I, I was wondering why in verse 15 he said, Feed my lambs. Ah, and the that's other what he said, Feed my sheep. Right. Yep. Okay. So, what just happened? All right. So, let me. Uh -oh. uh, <laughs> that's what I get for trying to act like I know what I'm doing. So, that is an observation. I have that's, a question. Um, okay. I'm going the wrong way. Okay. All right. Yes. Yes, sis. Uh, mine would be, why would he ask him, did he love him before he would tell them, tell him to feed his sheep? Amen. What was his, what was his point? Why were you asking him? You Good. know, do he love you? And Absolutely. before I tell you to feed my sheep. Absolutely. And, 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 sure. and, and this is what's happening is exactly what, how we want to be engaged with the word, right? Because now that we've read these verses and we're having some internal questions, we're going to now seek answers through the word. We might get it through the word right now, or we might have to wait for Abba to give us the proper understanding. Um, but before we, so we've dealt with a couple of questions. What about some of, some observations? When we say observations, you know, what what's the differences that we might see in these verses or things that might be, um, the same, Sister Elisheba. 
I'm over here talking with the back. <laughs> Hallelujah. So um, well, sis already brought it up, which was, you know, the uh, the difference of lamb and sheep. Um, but the similarity is it's it's going right through it. It's like, do you love me more? For me, it equated to you love me, so you take care of mine. If 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 you love me, then you love mine. You know, so you you that emphasis on feeding, you know, you had to shepherd the feed, you, you had to shepherd the sheep, but you also had to th there was more emphasis on feeding the sheep. So that's that's what came for me with like that it, it resounded the servitude in connection with the love walk being in hand. Amen. Amen. Any other observations of anything different or uh, Moria? Yeah, it was almost like he's he's delegating to him what he's now going to be responsible for. Amen. And the first thing is when he says to feed, it's like you service. All right. Amen. You're gonna take care, you're gonna take care of, of, of those who I'm leaving behind. And the second thing is you're gonna shepherd them. And when you are shepherd, you protect, you guard, you ensure that what's needed is provided. And um, so th those are the two things that that jumped out to me in, um, in, as far as observation. I'm not, I don't have the scriptures in front of me, so I can't remember how the third the third question is is phrased, but the, the first two are just, I, I recalled pretty um, clearly, so. Tora, tora, hallelujah. Um, I don't know how to raise my hand. Okay, so. Um, as a non-Catholic, but been around Catholics, I took it as the three of them in the name of the Father, okay. in the name of the Son, and the name of the Holy Spirit. Simon, do you love me? He's talking about his father. The second one was Simon, son of John, do you love me right. as his son? And the third one was, you know, I love you. Take care of my sheep as I'm going to have the Holy Spirit guide you. So in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and the name of the Holy Spirit. That's yeah. the way I took it. Okay. And I understand exactly how you got that understanding. But is that how they would have understood that? See, they would never have understood it that way. Because there was no concept of a three-in-one God, right? So the, they would have never can make that connection. And I'm just highlighting that because as we, as Bible students study the word, we have to understand it the way they would have understood it, right? Okay. From, from someone knowing what we know in modern um, Christianity, uh -huh. they would say, hmm, yep, that's exactly what that means. But that's not how any of the disciples would have gotten that, um, um, that reasoning. Now, there's no specific scripture that says he said three times, but I think it's we're not stretching like sister one of the sisters said that it is covering each one of those three times that he denied him. Right. Sister, a couple of sisters said, you know, what's in Peter's heart? Because remember, before Yahushua, where is that? I have that here somewhere. In John 13, verse 37. Can someone get that? In John 13, 37. We want to read 37 and 38. 13, 37 and what? 37 and 38. Peter asked, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Then Yahushua answered, will you really lay down your life for me? Very truly, I tell you, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. So, Yahushua was asking him this question. And he's really questioning Peter's heart, right? Because Peter's heart in chapter 13 is, I will, I, I'll go with you. I will never. And Yahushua, because he knows his heart. So, Yahushua was giving Peter this opportunity. He's like, all right. You know, because you should have been here before, right? And I believe even in verse 17, where Peter gets upset and Peter's like, Master, you know already, like, all I can do is tell you what I think I'm going to do. But you know. But each time Peter does say, I, I love you. I love you. 
I love you. Now, what does that mean for you and me, right? None of us will ever say in this moment, well, I'm going to serve God till this point. We'll never say that, right? We'll never say, well, God got me until this time and then I'm out. In our hearts, in the sounds of our minds, we believe we're going to serve Yahweh the rest of our lives to the best of our ability, imperfectly perfect or perfectly imperfect, but with a sincere heart. So this question is more about Peter's heart, right? Because Yahushua said this in Matthews, and I think he said also in Mark. He said, if you, if you don't love me more than your mother and your father and your sister and your brother, you can't be one of my disciples. Now the scripture says hate, but when you look at the Hebrew word for hate, when you're comparing two things, it's not that love hate, it's more love, love less, right? Because there really is no opposite to love, right? We think hate is the opposite of love, but that really isn't. Hate, the opposite of love is really indifference. Why well, I, I could even care if you're on fire, right? Hate is really, <laughs> like, I really want to see you have pain, but if I really don't care about you, I would even care if you're in pain, right? So that's really the opposite of, of love. It's not hate. So when Yahweh says like in his scriptures, you know, Jacob, I love, but Esau, I hate it. It doesn't mean he actually hated Esau to the point of he didn't want to see Esau alive because he gave special blessings to Esau. He even told Jacob, you know, Israel, like, you know, you can't touch what belonged to Esau. But when you think about it from the sense of, I love Jacob more than Esau, that makes sense, right? Same uh -huh. way how Joseph was loved more than his brothers. I mean, he hated his, uh, Jacob didn't hate his other 11 sons. He just loved them less than Joseph, right? So that who she was saying, if you don't love the people in your life, less than you love me, you can't be my disciple. So he's, like I said, he's given Peter this opportunity to repent and to search his heart. And my, sometimes it takes three times. And I'll share this with you. And there's a practice in Judaism. If you want to be a rabbi student, that rabbi is going to deny you like three times, right? You're going to go to this rabbi, let's say, you know, Rabbi Moshe, be like, hey, Rabbi Moshe, I want to be a part of your, your, your school, you know, because it wasn't so much synagogues, it was schools places of learning or yeshivas. Um, and the rabbi would be like, nah, uh, I'm not letting you in. That student would come back again. Hey, Rabbi Moshe, you know, I really want to be a part of your school. And the rabbi would be like, mm, nah, don't think you, you know. And by the third time, the rabbi, okay, this person is serious. Because each time they come, they're being more and more expressive how much they want to be in my school. And they're really showing me what they know about, you know, scripture. And Okay. So, is that another situation that Yahushua was doing with Peter? Is he really trying Peter's heart? You know, do you really love me, Peter? Um, um I'm sorry, Martha. I'm 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 gonna have to go. So I just wanted to make two quick points. Please. Um, the the first being, um, you know, he he asking Peter three times was for Peter. Hey. Um, it was to me. It was for a, a opportunity because you know he's going to come up he's going to he's going to come a, a, a up against challenges and so he needs to have something to reflect on to kind of keep him going forward when those times become difficult and he feels like giving up and it's almost like i made a promise to the to to to, to the messiah to his face you know and the um the other thing i wanted to say was how often you know how in previous lessons you kind of tied in how ancient judaism um practices continue today and so i think you just you just mentioned it about how the rabbis would turn down a student three times. And this is probably an ancient practice yeah. that has that that has continued to this time. So so Mashiach and Peter both knew Understood. what was happening yeah. that three time questioning. Hallelujah. That's that's a good thought. I'm gonna do some more study on that because like I said, that just that's what Yahweh is giving me now as we've been talking about it, but uh, making that connection with the rabbis. And I'm really going to look that that might have, like you said, because one of the things we said in the very beginning was how Yahushua chose his disciples, right? The way he chose them was how they chose their students. They would just go to their student, a person and say, follow me, right? Okay. He didn't know that. 
as regular Christian believers or non-Messianic believers that this is how rabbis chose their students, but because we understood the pr the practice behind how rabbis chose their students, that now said, mm -hmm. oh, so Yahushua was handpicking. So it's a good thought. I'm gonna have to remember to look more into that three, that pattern of three between rabbi and student. Um, mm -hmm. Amen, hallelujah. Um, but back to him questioning his heart, right? Um, and again, for us, are we willing to lay down our lives for the Messiah? And what does that look like for us, right? It looks like us denying ourselves, submitting ourselves to the Father and um, consciously and intentionally walking with the Father. And then we talked, then, you know, he says, first he says lamb, and then he says mm -hmm. sheep, right? And so, of course, you stop, you ask the question, then why, right? So you ask the basic question, what's the difference between a lamb and a sheep? You know, a lamb is a baby sheep, basically, right? And you don't feed lamb what you feed sheep. You feed lamb milk and sheep, they can eat vegetation, right? It's a, so we see here a process. We see a spectrum of believers, right? Yeah. Peter, and when we say Peter, not because this is why the Catholic Church has Peter as the first pope, because the construct of Christianity has taken this literally that this is only belonging to Peter. Mm -hmm. This does not only belong to Peter. This conversation Yahushua was having with Peter is for a very specific reason because of what has already transpired between him and Peter. But we can glean that as believers, as disciples, because we are all Yahushua's disciples, that the things that can apply to us can apply to us and do apply to us. So that means for us as disciples, we have to be able to feed those who are on the milk of the word and those who are on the meat of the word. And that's a process, right? I don't expect um, like Sister Precious, who she's been in her word for a very, very, very long time, but now she's beginning to look at things from a different point of view. I wouldn't expect her to be able to sit down with someone and give them the meat of the word because she's still on milk. The same way I would expect someone like Shula or Moria or Elisheba to be able to give um, some meat of the word because I know that these women have been walking this way for decades, you know, so, but see, but that full, that, that covers the whole spectrum of what us as disciples are supposed to be doing. And a couple of scriptures I want to take a look at, because I think is, these are, um, when you get done, can I add one more thing? Can I add? Jesus, absolutely. You can go ahead and talk now while I find the scripture. Okay. You know, I was just kind of looking at the fact when, um, uh, Yahshua had told him that you would, uh, you will uh, uh, bear the, I tell you before the cock crows, you will have denied me three times. But his experience, uh, Peter's experience now would have been when the, uh, when he said the last, and he said, yeah, you, yeah, sure, you know everything. Mm -hmm. You know everything. Because he was able to tell him what he was going to do. Now for him to even ask that question, I'm sure it kind of puzzled him because right. he's, you know exactly. everything. Right. That would have been his experience. Amen. Absolutely. That it wouldn't have been. Now he's puzzled. What's going on? Right. Absolutely. Hallelujah. Sister Shula. You know, I was just thinking about... Um... I was thinking about Peter and um, I wrote in the I wrote in the text um, that I mean we've all fallen short at some point. Yeah. You know what I mean? And um, he was full. He was sitting there with the master. He was in his presence, Amen. and he still had a moment of weakness. Yep. And Yehoshua had the foresight to, you know, not only, not only to to remind him, but he knew that he, he was being recorded. He knew that he had scribes with him. Um, but for those that would come in the future to 
um, learn from the times that we have walked contrary or denied the master and 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 be able to teach you know that's a testimony for 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 mm. Peter to have been able to um to go through that to get through that I mean Judas you know uh, for all we know Judas was done yep right there was no repentance for him nope you know but Amen. It does, it, we don't read about um Peter's or Kepa's uh repentance but that took repentance absolutely and that took a, a turn of heart and you know I'm sure he was crying for days after everything went down and um having denied the master but but you know reflecting back on these words and really being able to you know be strong in in the power of the master's might and and be able to get your you know repent and turn and and keep walking and keep keep striving to stand upright as Israel you know so absolutely. I was just thinking about Teshuva in the season that we're in also yep, you know absolutely. that that it had to take some major courage uh, for him to repent and get back on on the path amen absolutely when you imagine what he went through you could only imagine that it took some time but it was a great testimony a great testimony um so the, the the scripture I wanted to share was Isaiah 28. And this is about, you know, feeding the lamb and the sheep. Because he said specifically feed them, right? He didn't, he don't, he didn't say lead them. He didn't say water them. He said feed them. In Isaiah 28, verses 9 and 10, it says, Whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? But them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast." For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. We can't stay on milk as believers. We have to grow, right? In Peter, um, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2, Peter does say to desire the to desire the milk of the word, right? Everybody as a as a beginner, we should desire the milk, the basic teachings and principles of the word but that's not where we should stop. In Hebrews, the writer even reprimands the Hebrews, right? The book of Hebrews